so we stated a uh, few analytic uh, uh, a few properties that uh, and we restated them in analytic terms last time uh, now I'd like to concentrate some more on this analytic part uh, of this lecture so since w maybe uh, do you have any questions maybe I should ask first Uh, since uh, the, there was a question about Hilbert spaces last time, L let me uh, emphasize. So, in the definition of homology, uh, in the definition of usual homology, uh, you take the kernel and uh, then take the quotient by the image of the previous map. In L2 homology, you can define it in the same way, but L2 homology also uh, it's it's the same as the kernel of the i-dimensional of the i-th uh, boundary map by the image of the i plus first um, boundary map you can define it, we define it as a quotient, right? but this can also be represented as um, uh, both the image and the kernel, they are both subspaces in, um, in the space of um, i-dimensional L2 summable chains both are subspaces uh, so the closure of this is a Hilbert space uh, and this is also, a kernel is always closed this is a Hilbert space so, and um, uh, this, uh, this Hilbert space is a subspace in here so when you take the quotient that's equivalent for Hilbert spaces this is the standard fact that it's the same thing as taking the um, uh, orthogonal complement of this image in the kernel uh, so explicitly one can write it as follows uh, first you take the orthogonal complement of uh, I don't, uh, so I don't really have to take uh, this closure, but uh, we might take the closure as well. Uh, when you take the orthogonal complement, it doesn't matter. Uh, the orthogonal complement may be of this closure or just of the image, it's the same thing. Uh, intersection with the kernel, uh, with the kernel of DI. And now you notice that uh, this is the subspace, when I say orthogonal complement, it's the complement in the ambient space, in the space of all i-dimensional chains. Uh, this is a subspace of i-dimensional chains, this is a subspace of i-dimensional chains. So this intersection is also a subspace of i-dimensional chains uh, of y hat. So the homology is actually a subspace here. This is why we can talk about the dimension. Uh, if this comes uh, from some action of a group on a complex y hat, uh, then this becomes a Hilbert, uh, this is a Hilbert gamma module and this thing is a sub uh, closed in gamma invariant subspace in it so it's also a Hilbert gamma module so just wanted to, uh, to mention uh, recall how we proved uh, so we picked in the proof of the uh, Hannah Neumann conjecture we, we took x hat, y hat z hat, s hat uh, with the group action and then we picked uh, subsets in it uh, in these three we picked the set of other essential um, edges in y hat, in z hat and then in s hat and each of those we proved that each of these is a maximal essential uh, or rather the quotient, then we took the quotient this is the quotient of those sets uh, these are the uh, some sets of edges in Y, in Z and in S and then we show that each of these is a maximal essential set of edges the way we proved it was uh, first uh, by showing that it's essential so uh, you can prove it just for, for one of the uh, graphs of course uh, it's the same proof for the other two so uh, first you show that this set is uh, essential in order to do that you need to uh, first prove the deep fall property for graphs uh, we use that to prove that this is uh, essential uh, this set is essential and then uh, in order to prove maximality uh, and then we, we prove maximality as well uh, now if you want to translate this into more general terms uh, if you want to talk about complexes rather than uh, graphs. 
Uh, then you you would try, and if you want to prove the uh, sub-multiplicativity, uh, then you would try to mimic uh, the same argument, right? And you see what can be generalized. Uh, first, uh, you need to show that uh, uh, these sets are. You need some. You need some version, uh, some condition that would say that this is uh, essential. And that condition is the deep fall property. So the first thing that you would need to check is the deep fall uh, property uh, for uh, for the uh, gamma action on on y hat. Uh, in order to show that it's maximal, you actually, there is an explicit analytic argument to do that. And this analytic argument implies that maximality argument that, uh, that we showed. And I would like to present it. So the default property uh, might not um, necessarily, it might not uh, be satisfied always for any action. At least we don't know um, any examples so far. Uh, but uh, for the maximality, uh, the argument is pretty much immediate. Uh, so here is the argument. You remember, what does it mean for this set to be maximal? Uh, it means that if you remove this set, so E is maximal in the set of edges of some graph Y, what does this mean? It means that uh, if you remove this set of edges from Y, then the reduced rank of the rest is, is zero. Uh, now, what does it mean uh, for this particular situation? It means that you take this set of edges, E, Y, and you want to show that after removing this, the reduced trunk becomes zero. Reduced trunk of E, of, of Y minus E, Y is equal to zero. That's what we want to show. Uh, now you notice that let's consider a completely general situation. So instead of edges here, I'm going to consider i-dimensional simplices. So we defined, so more generally, uh, more generally consider a group action on uh, on y hat uh, as before, uh, call compact and free. And consider the set of order essential, and assume that gamma is a left orderable group. Consider the set of order essential i dimensional simplices, i dimensional cells in uh, y hat. This is a subset of sigma i y hat. So this is the set of all i dimensional cells. This is a subset in it, consisting of only. The uh, order essential ones. You remember uh, we gave a general analytic definition of what for um, what it means for i dimensional cell to be uh, order essential. Uh, then to show, we want to show. So what's the analog of this statement here? We show that the reduced rank for graphs is the same thing as the first L2 Betty number. So in the situation where that, that graph is a quotient, is the quotient of uh, some group action, some free co-compact group action, uh, then the reduced rank of the quotient is the same thing as the first l 2 bt number of, uh, of that graph uh, whose quotient we took. Uh, so in this situation, uh, we can generalize from graphs to complexes. And uh, the more general statement would be, What's the uh, reduced rank of, uh, instead of the reduced rank, what's the uh, first l 2 bt number? Or, if you want to talk about the dimension i, that would be the i-dimensional. And rather uh, saying b, it's not really the l 2 bt number, but rather the dimension of the kernel that we are talking about. It's a uh, number i. So it's the number, the l 2 number, uh, which is the dimension of the kernel. Uh, we want to show that that number of uh, y hat, uh, when we take y hat and remove all those other essential cells, we want to show that this is zero. Right. So this is a more general 
the restatement of, of this. So let's see what the problem is. We have an action of the group on some cell complex. We consider the i-dimensional cells. We consider some order on the set of i-dimensional cells. And with respect to that order, we pick other essential cells in it. Then we remove all those. And the question is, after you remove, is it true that the number becomes zero? So let's see what the number is. Why is AI more natural than BI? Uh, because it makes the argument work. <laughs> uh, in the case of graphs, it's the same thing, right? Because uh, the first homology is the same thing as just the kernel of the boundary map. Uh, but uh, just because this argument naturally works for AI. And what is it? Let's see. So in other words, we take uh, ci of y hat and then the map to ci minus 1 to uh, y hat. This is the boundary map. Right. Now, what is this? This is L2 of, L2 of the set of i-dimensional cells. This is L2 of the set of i minus 1 dimensional cells. Uh, so these are several copies of gamma. Gamma cross some finite set. These are also gamma cross some finite set. Uh, now what is this set here? It's written right here and we have other essential cells in it. The complement of this set is the set of other inessential cells. So sigma i of y hat is the disjoint union of the essential um, i-dimensional cells and the other inessential i-dimensional cells. So this L2 now uh, is split into two parts. We split the base of this Hilbert space. So this is the same thing as L2 of the other essential ones uh, plus L2 of the other inessential cells. And then we take the boundary map number i uh, to this space, uh, whatever it is. So let, let me just write it ci minus 1, 2, y hat. Uh, this is the boundary map. Now, what is this number? We take y hat and we remove the other essential cells. It means that we just remove this part of this uh, sum. Uh, it means that we only restrict this boundary map to L2 of y hat ci minus 1 right it's the restriction uh, what is our goal our goal is to show that this number is zero this number is by definition is the kernel of this uh, is the kernel of this map the, uh, of this particular map so uh, what we want to show is that the kernel of this map is zero in other words, we need to check that this map is injective. So, and this is the claim. The claim this map is injective. Uh, this restricted map uh, is injective. Uh, why is this injective? We need to trace uh, the definition of other inessential cells. So, a sigma is so here is the proof. The sigma is, uh, let's take an i-dimensional cell, is order inessential if, uh, if it's not order essential, right? Which is, uh, what's the analytic definition? It means that the boundary of sigma does not belong. It's the opposite of being order essential. Does not belong to the boundary of L2. Um, of the space spanned by i-dimensional cells that are less than sigma. Uh, the closure. Uh, so sigma represents an element in here. So each sigma in this uh, satisfies this property. And now, of course, I can just restrict. Uh, here I took the i-dimensional cells. And of course, I can, I can consider a smaller 
smaller subspace here, D, L2, of just other and essential ones, less than sigma. It should be clear that this is a subspace of this. So if sigma does not belong here, it also does not belong here. If the boundary does not belong. Uh, okay, so let's consider uh, let's consider uh, the strict inequality and the non-strict inequality. So let's take this set i-dimensional cells in y hat, which are uh, less than or equal to sigma, and also consider the set of other inessential cells, which are strictly less than sigma. So the difference between these two, this is a set of um, cells. Uh, the difference between the two sets is just one cell. Uh, then we take L2 of that. So this is a Hilbert space now. And this is a Hilbert space. And the difference of dimensions of those Hilbert spaces is just one, exactly one. The dimensions are different by one. This is an infinite vector space, and this is also an in infinite dimensional vector space, and this is also infinite dimensional. But if I take um, like a basis, or, or say you take the orthogonal complement, say, of this in this, then that orthogonal complement is one dimensional vector space. But now we, take, uh, we want to take the boundary, uh, the boundary of this. Uh, now what can we say? Uh, we take the boundary and take uh, the closure. Uh, what can we say about uh, these spaces? Uh, the difference is only in sigma, right? And uh, in to this sigma, we now apply the, uh, the operator delta, uh, D. Uh, but uh, applying D to sigma, this condition says that it does not lie in here. So this d applied to sigma does not lie in this space. It's um, disjoint from it. Uh, so if we, uh, so then this is a subspace of this, and the question is, uh, what's the difference in dimensions of those? Uh, the claim is that the dimension is exactly one, the difference of dimensions. So formally, if I take this space and take the orthogonal complement of this, and then intersect it. Uh, with with this space, right? Uh, then let's call it let's call it v sub sigma. Uh, what's the dimension of this vector space? All vectors in here which are orthogonal to this. The dimension of this vector space is one. Uh, you can orthogonalize, right? You can take d sigma. It does not lie in this space. And you can, you can find the vector which is orthogonal to this space, which is non-zero. Uh, so this is what this V sigma is. It's generated by that orthogonal vector. So when you say dimension, you mean gamma dimension? No, just usual regular dimension over, uh, since we are taking complex numbers here, over complex numbers, or real numbers you can take, depending on what you mean by L2 here. So say, if this is the it's set not, of functions. It's not gamma module, right? Uh, this is not a gamma module. This set is not invariant under gamma. It's not a gamma module. I'm talking just about Hilbert spaces with no gamma module structure. Uh, so this is a vector space and the dimension, so the dimension, the usual dimension over complex numbers, if you take complex numbers as coefficients uh, of this V sigma is one. So let uh, let E sub sigma be uh, a basis vector. So I'm just taking one, it's a one dimensional vector space. I'm taking the basis of this, consisting of one vector. And we can choose also, so okay, what happens if I, uh, now I introduce the group action. Uh, what if I took, so take some uh, g in gamma. Uh, what, can we uh, uh, what can we say about g sigma? So consider the shift of sigma by g. 
there is the corresponding vector space G sigma. Uh, the vector space that corresponds to G sigma. This is the same thing as first considering V sub G, uh, V sub uh, sigma, and then applying G to that. Because this definition is gamma invariant. Uh, I, this space is not invariant, but uh, I'm just uh, translating the whole definition. In this definition, I replace sigma with G sigma everywhere. Uh, so, and the result is the translate of that vector space by G. Okay, what is this basis vector? So we can choose choose the E sub sigma so that so that um, uh, E corresponding to G sub sigma so it's the vector corresponding to the shift of sigma is similarly G times E sub sigma just uh, pick a basis vector in each of those V sub sigma in an equivariant way uh, just pick a basis vector for one fixed sigma and then extend it by the group action uh, in an equivariant way okay so we have a set of vectors uh, this here the set of all such vectors it's a set of vectors and it's invariant under the group uh, we take sigma to be any so sigma here runs through uh, order inessential cells right this is a set which is invariant under gamma and therefore uh, we have a set of vectors which is invariant under gamma and orbit of vectors uh, yeah okay what else can we say so if uh, sigma I is not equal to tau and sigma and tau are in here uh, what can we say about these vectors so what can we say about E sub sigma and what can we say about E sub tau uh, you look at this definition so E sub sigma lies in here uh, e sub tau would be the same thing with sigma replaced by tau everywhere but the point is that um, since they are not equal one of them uh, we have an ordering one of them should be bigger than the other so for example uh, for example sigma is less than tau if sigma is less than tau then what can we say so you write this definition for sigma and then you write the same definition for tau. Yeah. By the way, does the G action really commutes with boundary map? Yeah. Uh, so the G action, yeah, I should have said, yeah. Uh, the G action commutes with the boundary map. Uh, that's, I mean, you need to write explicitly the definition of the boundary map. So to each, like, in dimension two, say, you have two-dimensional cell, and what does the boundary map do? It replaces this two-dimensional cell with a linear combination of one-dimensional cells which form the boundary of that. Right? But now if you translate this two-dimensional cell by some element and then take the boundary, it's the same thing as taking first uh, the boundary and then translating by some element, by the same element of the group. Right? It pretty much follows from the definition. Yeah. Uh, the group commutes with the boundary map. Yeah. So if sigma is less than tau, so let's try this. Maybe maybe it's a good exercise, a uh, good physical exercise to, to write this. Uh, I, uh, the orthogonal complement. So this is for sigma intersection with the L two orthogonal complement less than or equal than sigma. Uh, this is where tau. Uh, this is where sigma lives, uh, E sub sigma lives. Uh, and tau lives in the same thing, L2, but replaced by tau. Tau. This is E sub tau.
Uh, yeah, and sigma is, uh, sigma is less than tau. See, tau is bigger than sigma. Uh, see, since sigma is less than tau, then what? Consider this space. Uh, this space lies in this space. Since, uh, because, uh, because this set here is bigger than this set. By, by our assumption. So this is a subspace of this space. Uh, and um, E sub sigma lies in here. Uh, e sub sigma lies in here, but E sub tau lies in, in the orthogonal complement to this. So that means that, what's the conclusion here? The conclusion is that these two vectors are orthogonal to each other. Of course, if tau is less than sigma, then exactly the same symmetric argument applies that uh, they are orthogonal. So if sigma and tau are two different elements of this set, then they are the corresponding vectors that we obtain by orthogonalizing. Is, uh, uh, those vectors are orthogonal. And of course, I'm taking the unit vector. This is uh, supposed to be of unit length. So what does it say? It says that E sub sigma, sigma uh, for sigma in I uh, is, is an orthonormal basis or other uh, it's a, at least it's an orthonormal set right it's an ortho orthonormal set set in in where uh, in in the space spanned by, so in L2 of the i-dimensional the other essential cells. So what does it tell us? So we, we had this uh, L2 of I Y hat uh, so let me consider the uh, the boundary of let's see uh, the, the boundary map of L2 of I Y hat so we, we had this map first and then we, we replaced it so I can consider a different map um, consider, yeah, I should take the closure here, a different map, a, a different map is, uh, it, it takes sigma and maps it to uh, E sub sigma. What can we say about this different map? Um, when you change sigma, this uh, goes to uh, some orthonormal set. It's an injective map. Uh, so this map, uh, this map is isometric embedding. Uh, isometric embedding of this into this. Yeah, so what does it tell us about the original map, D? Since this is an isometric embedding, it is injective in particular, right? The kernel of this map is the same. Uh, what's the image of this? So into, uh, it's again in the same, so it's L2, it's the same space, L2 of I. Uh, but this is now an isometric embedding. This map is injective. Uh, this implies in particular that the dimension of this space is at most the dimension of this. Uh, also, what can we say about this map? So this implies that the uh, dimension of L2 of y hat is at most over gamma is at most the dimension over gamma of L2 of of the boundary of the boundary of the same thing 
L2 by Y hat. Okay. Uh, but what's the goal? We want to show that this map is injective. In order to show that this is injective, it suffices to show that uh, it suffices to show the opposite inclusion, we, we, uh, the opposite inequality. If we check that the dimension of this is at most the dimension of this, then we will be done. This map is uh, so. Let's see. Um, This d uh, d hat, so I should have said maybe. Well, let's make a little change here. So let's take let's take the boundary here L two i y hat. Wait, uh, what can we say about this map? This map is weakly surjective. Just by definition, I took the image of this. Uh, this map is weakly surjective because uh, without closure it is surjective. Uh, when you take the closure, that's what we mean by weak surjectivity. The image of this map um, is dense in, in the range here. But then, what can we say about this map? I claim that this map is, uh, it has the same image. Uh, why is that? Because what's the difference? The difference is in other essential cells. So I'm claiming here that the image of this map lies in the image of this map. Uh, why is this? Because any, because for any sigma in other essential uh, dimensional cells. What's the definition of, uh, of essential? It means that the boundary of sigma lies in the boundary of L2 of the smaller cells. Sigma i. I had less than sigma of the boundary. And uh, then we can apply the, let's see, yeah, I'm using here, uh, I'm using the deep fall property. This lies in where? The deep fall property says that if this is the case, then I can replace this sigma with what? With only the inessential ones. So uh, then it implies, maybe uh, let me just erase this. So by the deep fall property, uh, it means that uh, this lies in the other inessential ones as well. And that means that uh, this this whole term will go to the image of this term. This is a subset of this subspace. Uh, this implies that. So what all I wanted to say is that uh, this implies that this map is. Yeah, I guess I'm making it more complicated then. Sorry, it's, it's much easier, sorry. Yeah, all we need to show that the dimension of this is smaller than the dimension of this. And this map is obviously weakly surjective. Yeah, I didn't need, sorry, I didn't need that argument. Uh, we will need it later on, that's why I'm confused. So, we show that uh, the dimension of this is at most the dimension of this, because we provided an injective map. Uh, and the converse follows from here. This is a weakly surjective map. The dimension of gamma dl2 of y hat boundary is at most. So it's the opposite inequality. Dimension of uh, gamma dl2 of y y hat. So once again, the first inequality follows from the fact that this map is injective. And it commutes with the group action. Yeah, it's a map of Hilbert gamma module. 
The second inequality follows from the fact that this is weakly surjective. So it's a, like for finite dimensional vector spaces. If you have a surjective map of one finite dimensional space onto the other, then the domain uh, has bigger dimension than uh, the range. Uh, so you combine these two inequalities, it shows that the dimensions are, must be the same. Since the dimensions are the same, and this map is weakly surjective, then what's the kernel of this map? What's the dimension of the kernel of this map? Dimension of the kernel on this map must be zero. It's the different. Uh, you make a short exact sequence, right? This into this, and then take the kernel. The dimension of the kernel will be this term. Uh, the dimension of this term minus the dimension of this term, right? Uh, but since they are equal, it means that the dimension of the kernel, the dimension of the kernel of d i. So this is d number i. Uh, di is, is 1, is 0. And then by the homework exercise, that means that the kernel of di is, is 0. Yeah, sorry. But I don't really need that. Uh, this means that di is injective. i is injective. And the first L2 number is zero, that's what we want. So pretty much the argument was considering this map and showing that this map is injective. Then you, it implies that uh, the corresponding L2 number is zero and that it implies that uh, the uh, reduced rank e is zero. So the point of this is to show that uh, uh, this maximality can be shown just purely by analytic argument first of all. And moreover, it works not only for, uh, not only for uh, graphs, but for any complexes. That was the point. It's a, com a completely general argument. So we didn't use the default? Yeah, we, we didn't use it, yeah. It, not, uh, not in this case. You see, but you will need this default property when you want to write the estimates for. When, it, when, you, wa when you want to find the um, uh, the cardinality of this set, uh, right? Then you would need it. Uh, let's see. Do we actually need it? Yeah, we don't need. We don't use that property here. Uh, so uh, recall this submultiplicativity. So uh, formally, it can be stated using a category. Right? We talked about leafages. So the category of leafages. So you fix some. Uh, complex x hat uh, with a group action as before, say co compact and three, and then uh, uh, you form a category. You consider all possible leafages over x hat, so objects in the category leafages. y hat over x hat. Uh, and you require them gamma invariant, gamma equivariant. So we assume that there is a gamma action on this, uh, so that uh, the gamma action commutes, uh, this map commutes with the gamma actions on y hat and x. Right? In this category, you can form the fiber product. So, yeah, and I should have said what a morphism is, right? A morphism would be a leafage again. So it's like a map y prime hat to y 
pick some reasonable map. Uh, there are a few ways, a few versions of this. So two objects. These are two objects in this category and you say a morphism between them is a map like this which uh, forms a commutative, uh, commutative diagram. And then you require this map to be say a leafage as well, uh, for example. And then you put an order, you order, order the i-dimensional cells in x hat and this gives, uh, use that order to induce an ordering on the i-dimensional cells in, in y hat. The, in other words, uh, you can require those objects to preserve the order uh, on each component. So that uh, becomes a category. And in this category you can form um, uh, fiber products. <coughs> if you have two maps Uh, then you define the fiber product in just exactly the same way as we did. Fiber product of two leafages is a leafage and if you assume there is an order on X hat you can induce an order on um, S hat as well uh, of edges. And then you ask that sub-multiplicativity, right? Uh, consider uh, the Betty numbers, uh, the L2 Betty numbers or those, um, the A numbers for y hat, z hat and s hat and you require that the number corresponding to s hat is at most the product of numbers corresponding to these and these. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that uh, there is a categorical uh, definition for this. Uh, so further uh, formalizing, so the next uh, step would be to consider just purely kind of analytic questions with no group actions or anything at all and that question uh, it's, it's called rather a problem it's called the ATIA problem but before I talk about that maybe uh, let me say a question that comes from algebra from ring theory uh, this is the uh, zero divisor the divisor conjecture um, uh, due to Kaplansky uh, it was uh, officially it was uh, posed 1956 1957 which are the same years as uh, when Hanna Neumann uh, wrote her papers so uh, there is one paper by Han Neumann in 1956 and then another short addition to it in 1957. Uh, this question was also raised by Kaplansky at some conference on 19, in 1957 and it was published in 1956 in exactly those two years. Uh, the question is the following. So first we need to define, start with a group. Uh, group uh, gamma. We need to define uh, what is called a group ring. So pick some coefficients. We have a choice of coefficients. Say, uh, pick some ring, uh, like integers. Pick some integral domain. Uh, so say z or uh, rational numbers or real numbers or complex numbers. Uh, so pick some integral domain or a field like this. And uh, the group ring Z gamma so let me write the definition for Z but the same definition can be done for any of these so the group ring maybe I should ask if you know the definition raise, raise your hand if you know the definition of this uh, the group ring maybe I should write explicitly what it is the group ring consists of formal linear combinations of gamma. So the elements uh, are uh, formal uh, combinations uh, of the form sigma. Uh, so we take the elements of the group, let's call them G, 
And then in front of that element, you put some coefficient, let's call it alpha sub g. So where g is in uh, gamma and alpha sub g is uh, in the integers in this case. And we assume that alpha sub g is 0 except except uh, for uh, finitely many. Many g in, g in gamma. So it's a finite linear combination. All those coefficients are mostly required to be 0, except for finitely many of them. Uh, so the group ring consists of all such formal linear combinations, and then we add them alpha g g plus sigma beta g g. Maybe I should remove this. Plus, by definition, we just add them as vectors. So think of them vectors uh, in the vector space, which is spanned by the elements of the group. Over g, over g. You just take the sum, alpha g plus beta g. Over all elements. So the addition is pointwise. So what's the multiplication? Uh, it's a group ring. So that suggests that it should be a product operation. We should be able to multiply those. So we take two linear combinations, alpha g, and then take another one. I will use a different letter. So it will be beta sub h times h, where h is in gamma. So what's the product? The product is just as you multiply polynomials. Right? Uh, you multiply g times h, and then you multiply the coefficients alpha times beta. Uh, but that's not a good definition. I mean, it's philosophically correct, but it's, uh, it doesn't quite fit the definition of the group ring. The reason is that uh, this g times h might be also equal to some kind of g prime times h prime. The product of these two elements might be equal to the product of some other two elements. So uh, we will have a linear combination which is redundant. Uh, what we need, we need to collect like terms after that. So yes, you multiply it out and write it as a kind of double linear combination. But after that, you need to collect uh, like terms. So what's the, uh, what's the result? After you collect uh, like terms, what will we get? Uh, let's say k belongs to gamma times, times k. Right. I want to put a coefficient in front of k, and that's going to be an expression in terms of this. After you collect like terms, what are those? It's the sum of um, what alpha h beta uh, alpha g beta h times k, where g and h are what? So g and h are in gamma, uh, and with the property that what? Yeah, g h equals k. So this is the product, right? You multiply out, and then you collect like terms. Uh, it's an interesting. Uh, exercise, uh, take, uh, say, a finite group, gamma. Uh, pick some linear combination of the elements. Uh, then pick another linear combination of the elements. And, and write the product, see, see what it is, actually, explicitly, for a given group. So what is the zero element in this group ring? So it's a ring. One checks that with these operations, uh, this becomes a, a ring. Zero is an element of Z gamma. What is zero? What does zero mean? Uh, what's that? Yeah, every coefficient uh, must be zero. It's the linear combination corresponding to the uh, zero linear, uh, which is the zero linear combination. It's the linear combination with zero coefficients everywhere. Uh, can it happen that 
I take one linear combination, then take another linear combination, then multiply them. Can it happen that you get zero as a result? And this is what the zero divisor conjecture of Kaplansky is. So zero divisors are elements, elements alpha and beta uh, of the group ring. Zero divisors in this group ring are some elements whose product is zero. Uh, and we require them to be non-zero elements. So each element is non-zero, but they are a product such that alpha times beta is zero. Uh, can this happen? Uh, the first question. Maybe it never happens. So I haven't stated the conjecture yet, right? I'm trying to lead to it first. Uh, what's that? Yeah, one can consider, say, cyclic group. Yeah, let's take, say, Z, Z5. So that's the group consisting of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. The, the cyclic group of five elements. Uh, okay, but I want to write this since we use multiplicative notation here. You see, uh, we wrote uh, we wrote g times g times h here. I used multiplicative notation, so I better use multiplicative notation for that group. This is uh, the same as saying t, uh, where t to the fifth power is equal to one. So uh, I'm going to write the same operation multiplicatively. Okay, so what? What does it have to do with zero divisors? Yeah, one can take the linear combination, say one, what, one minus t. Right? That's the same thing as what? It's one times one plus uh, plus minus one times t. That, that's. It's a linear combination of uh, the element 1 of the group and the element t of the group with coefficients 1 and minus 1. And then one can take 1 plus t plus t squared plus t cubed plus t to the fourth. Again, this is a linear combination of the elements 1, t, t squared with coefficient 1 everywhere. And then take the product. So 1 minus t, 1 plus t plus t squared plus t cubed plus t to the fourth. So what's the result? If you multiply by 1, it's this expression. If you multiply by minus t, it will be the same expression because t fourth multiply by t, it will be 1. So you just cyclically, multiplying by t just cyclically permutes those terms. But if it comes with minus sign, it will be exactly the same linear combination with the opposite sign. When you collect like terms, you will get 0. So in Z5, in Z, Z5, let me write it this way. It's the group ring of Z5, of the multiplicative group Z5, with coefficients in Z. Uh, this has zero divisors. So what's, what should be the conjecture then? Uh, let me uh, write it here. So the conjecture says that unless this is the case, in other cases uh, there should be no zero divisors at all. So that means that if, if gamma is torsion free, then uh, Z gamma, Z gamma or um, s Q gamma, R gamma, C gamma there are various versions of it depending on what coefficients you pick the original conjecture was stated for fields so you can put any field here okay. has no no zero divisors 
and it has been open ever since. It's still uh, an open question. Uh, can you find an example of a group without torsion? Uh, such that the corresponding group ring uh, has zero divisors? That's a very interesting question. Uh, or at least uh, try to produce many examples of groups uh, for which the zero divisor conjecture uh, does hold. So one example, give me a torsion-free group for which the zero divisor conjecture certainly does hold. Z. Z is the easiest uh, non-finite, uh, non infinite, uh, torsion-free group. So Z satisfies satisfies the zero divisors conjecture. Okay, this requires a proof. So we take this to be gamma, right? Uh, I will denote this gamma so that we don't confuse two z's. So consider z gamma. So z is here, it's a ring, and this gamma is the group isomorphic to z. Multiplicative group. So what is z gamma? How can you visualize this? You take uh, the set of all elements in gamma. Those are integer numbers. 0, 1, 2, and so on. And then you pick two elements. Um, alpha and beta in Z gamma. What are those elements? Uh, alpha is a linear combination of group elements. So you can think of this being a function on, on here. So if, if <coughs> alpha is the sum of alpha sub G, G, so G is in gamma, uh, then you can think of this uh, as a function, if you like, to each to each group element G, you associate alpha sub G. It's a function from the group to the coefficients. Um, so to visualize this, you take any element of the group and just assign, you draw the graph of this. Uh, you assign a number. The value at this point is this, the value at this point is this, and so on. And you consider only those points for which alpha sub G is non-zero. In other words, consider the support, the support of alpha and support, support of beta. Now, this is the set of all elements in the group. Maybe I should write this uh, in G such that alpha sub G is non-zero. So the support of alpha would be somewhere here. Say this is the support of alpha. Uh, and the support of beta may be, may be somewhere here. This is the support of beta. Uh, what do we want to check? We want to check that uh, no matter what alpha and beta you take, if they are both non-zero elements, non-zero linear combinations, uh, then their product must be non-zero as well. So to check, we take this alpha, which are not zero elements. We want to check that the product of them is non-zero. Uh, you just look at this picture and prove it. Uh, how do you do this? Uh, you need to check that the, uh, the product is non-zero, but the product is a linear combination. So uh, you need to see what that linear combination is, and then uh, to convince yourself that uh, there is at least one element of the group which comes with a non-zero coefficient in this uh, linear combination. Uh, you just need to explicitly provide that element. Uh, all those elements are of the form, you remember, k is equal to g times h. Right? All those elements in the support of the product, uh, they are products of the elements in here. Uh, so you just need to provide g and h, uh, you need to find some k for which the coefficient at that k is non-zero in the product. So what's the... You just look at the picture. Where, where is that element? 
largest one? Yeah, you can take the largest, say the support. You take the support of alpha, this is the largest point, in, uh, the rightmost point uh, in the support. And in the support of beta also, you pick the rightmost uh, point. And call this, call this G prime and call this H prime. Those are the maximal uh, points in the support of Z. Uh, then uh, consider this K prime, which is G prime times H prime. Okay, we claim that what's the coefficient? Uh, the coefficient in front of the uh, coefficient in in the product in alpha beta um, at at this G, uh, at this k prime. Uh, what is this coefficient? Is by the definition of the product, how do we multiply? We take the coefficient which was at g prime in alpha and multiply it by the coefficient at h prime in beta. It's the product, right? But then we collect like terms also, right? We need to make sure that there is no other term which cancels this later on. Uh, and then that you just check by showing that any other pair would never give you k prime. You pick any other. Um, you pick any pair, G and H, such that G is in here, H is in here. Uh, but uh, this pair is not the same as this pair. And you check that the product in that pair would be different from K prime. Uh, how do you check this? You use the fact that, uh, I don't know, if 3 is less than 5, then 2 times 3 is less than 2 times 5. Uh, you, you use this implication here. Um, in other words, yeah, three and five maybe was not. Maybe I should say plus here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm thinking of this multiplicatively, right? Uh, plus. So what I'm using here is the invariance of the ordering on the uh, set of integer numbers. Uh, using that, you check that k prime uh, cannot be. This is the only way to obtain k prime as a product of two elements in the support of alpha and the support of beta. So it means that the coefficient in, in at k prime is exactly the coefficient at g prime, which is alpha g prime, times the coefficient beta h prime. Uh, it comes just once, and it doesn't cancel with anything else. There is no other coefficients at k prime. You have a question? I think we have to choose g1 and h1 such that the absolute value has to be Kind of rational. But we are adding that multiplier. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's this. I'm using the multiplicative way of thinking of the addition operation on the integers. Um, when I say z here, z means gamma, and gamma means it's generated by some element t. It's the group uh, multiplicatively. So instead of addition, I just rewrite everything in terms of multiplication so that I don't confuse the operations here and the operations here. It's important to write uh, the operation on gamma multiplicatively. So I'm thinking of addition on z. Uh, this is gamma uh, in multiplicative terms. So when I wrote 2 plus 3 here, I actually mean uh, I rewrite it as multiplication later on. Yeah, it's very important not to confuse multiplication and addition here. Uh, for gamma, the convention is that for gamma you always use multiplication to make sense of this uh, uh, group ring. Does it make sense? Yeah, so uh, the coefficient in alpha beta is this. But what can we say about this coefficient? It's a product of two numbers. What are those numbers? This alpha sub g prime. It's the coefficient of this term. But this term is in the support. Uh, it means that alpha is a non-zero uh, element. The same thing for this. Beta of h prime is also a non-zero element of the ring, of the ring z. Uh, and what do we know about the ring z? If you take two non-zero numbers and now multiply them, 
actually multiply the uh, numbers uh, in the ring. Uh, then this is non-zero. Uh, this proves that uh, this proves that uh, the product of alpha and beta is non-zero. Alpha times beta is non-zero. Uh, this proves the uh, zero divisor conjecture for the uh, uh, group Z. Uh, you follow the proof and you see all we used here is the fact that uh, the set of integers is left orderable. Is orderable. We used the fact that that uh, Z is by orderable. We actually used by orderability. It's a commutative group, so it doesn't really matter. Multiply on the left or multiply, on, uh, like add on the left or add on the right, um, the integer numbers. Uh, but if, uh, if we look at this argument, uh, we actually used by orderability. We used the fact that there is an ordering on the group, uh, which is invariant both by left multiplication and by the right multiplication in, in, this, uh, in this proof here. So the uh, claim or the theorem, uh, the more general statement is that any uh, left orderable, uh, left orderable group uh, satisfies uh, the zero divisor conjecture. Uh, we actually don't need by orderability. Actually, there is an argument which uh, requires only left orderability, a weaker assumption, and which guarantees that there are no zero divisors. But philosophically, the argument is pretty much the same. So I will not write it completely. You might uh, do it uh, as an exercise. But uh, it's a similar argument, but with a little bit more work. Uh, you need to make sure that you use only left orderability and not by orderability of the group. Uh, so in particular, uh, you can check that this implies that if you start with a left orderable group, then it satisfies the zero divisor conjecture. Uh, then this group cannot be Z5. It cannot be the cyclic group, for example. Because we checked that uh, in the cyclic group there are zero divisors. Uh, more generally, this implies that any left orderable group has no torsion. So another claim. Any uh, left orderable uh, group uh, has no torsion. Uh, it's, it follows from this, but uh, one can certainly prove this directly, actually. Uh, you start with any left orderable group, and then assume there is torsion in it. And then you obtain a contradiction. How do we obtain a contradiction? How do you check that Z5 is not uh, left orderable? So example, Z5 is not left orderable. How do you prove this? You just take five elements of Z5, uh, write them multiplicatively. 1, C, T squared, T cubed, T to the fourth. Uh, and if you assume there is an ordering, it means that, say, uh, so if uh, 1 is less than T, there are two cases to consider. Either 1 is less than T or T is less than 1. So if 1 is less than T, then then what uh, do you get? 1 is less than t, but then I can multiply both sides on the left uh, by, uh, which doesn't really matter in this case, but uh, just multiplying on the left is enough. I multiply on the left, you get uh, t is less than t squared. Multiplying this on the left by t, uh, you get this is less than t cubed, this is less than t fourth. 
and then you do one more step, right? This is less than what? One. And you get that one is strictly less than one, which is a contradiction. So, uh, certainly, there is a direct way of proving this. So, all left orderable groups uh, have no torsion. Uh, they do satisfy the zero divisor conjecture. Uh, let's restate slightly the zero divisor. Restate. The zero divide. Uh, it says the following: start with a group, uh, consider the group ring, and consider the product operation. This is just the multiplication operation. It's the dot, uh, where alpha comma beta go to alpha beta. So what's an equivalent three statement of the zero divisor conjecture? It says that for any non-zero alpha and beta, uh, the product must be non-zero. Uh, that means that if I fix, say, uh, an equivalent way of saying this uh, would be if I fix, say, beta, and consider all possible alpha. Uh, consider the restricted version of this, z gamma uh, to z gamma. It's the operation of multiplying by beta. You fix some beta. Uh, to say that uh, z gamma satisfies the zero divisor conjecture is equivalent to saying that uh, you consider this map. It, uh, it maps alpha to alpha times beta for a fixed beta. The zero divisor conjecture equivalently says that what? For any, for any beta, so for any, uh, for any beta in z gamma, which is non-zero, uh, what should we have? Uh, this map, uh, uh, for any non-zero alpha, the result of this map must be also non-zero. But that's equivalently equivalent to saying that this product operation is injective. Uh, the, map, uh, the map delta beta is injective. So it's an injectivity of certain multiplication function. Uh, instead of z, of course, we can consider uh, rational numbers or real numbers or, say, complex numbers. Uh, a parallel restatement, a parallel version of the zero divisor conjecture would be the one with coefficients in complex numbers. C gamma. Okay, but since we have the complex numbers, uh, what are the elements in here? The elements in here are linear combinations of the elements of the group. Uh, you take finitely many um, elements of the group and put a coefficient on, on each of them. Uh, there is a very natural generalization of this, which we already saw. Instead of considering finite linear combinations, one can take infinite linear combinations and require them to be L2 summable. Uh, a very natural generalization of this uh, is L2 of gamma uh, mapped to L2 of gamma uh, by some beta, where beta is again in, uh, in say, in a uh, uh, group ring over complex numbers. So the question is, which I will leave for the next time, is how does this um, uh, uh, what does it tell you about the analytic way of restating the uh, zero divisor conjecture? What's the analytic form of the zero divisor conjecture? And that is what is called the Atiyah problem, and I will 
talk about it next time.